The NFL season is heating up and so is the NFL coach's hot seat. I was a guest this time on the 1999 podcast. You guys may have seen Leal on the show in the past. I went over to his YouTube channel. I'll leave the link in the description below if you guys want to check out his stuff after the conversation. To discuss which coaches are on the hot seat right now, which coaches are going to survive this season and have a job next year, which coaches are probably going to get canned pretty soon. All right, I'm going to toss the mic over to a different version of myself now. Our hot seat segment, and the season is just about two months done. And I thought it would be a great time to go around the league and discuss some of these coaches because, well, I, I told Mike just before you hopped on, coaching is a premium. I know that has been something I've always harped on in our years doing this show that it doesn't matter how much talent have you have. If you do not have the right coaching staff, none of it will matter. And you're seeing that with a ton of teams around the league right now. And I thought it would be a great time to go around the league, take a quick temperature check around some coaches that we think might be on the hot seat. So what we're going to do is list some coaches and we're going to put them into categories. They're e either mild, which is, yeah, they may might be on the hot seat, but they're not there yet. And they're kind of climbing their way back out hot, which means your seat is pretty hot, but you're not definitely fired or you could be scorching hot, which means, yeah, more likely than not, you're gone. So I'm looking forward to this segment. And without further ado, I'll hand it over back to you. Let's do it. Um, we're going to go with our first coach and we are going to go with let's go with um kevin Stefanski. Stefanski, let's go with him nfl mike i'll begin with you are we going mild medium hot hot or scorching hot it's unfortunate for my guy kevin Stefanski because i feel terrible for him i feel like maybe he might not have done this if he was the only one making some of these decisions and put himself into a scorching hot seat at this point in his career because i think he's a good offensive coach at least I feel like the Browns put some pretty impressive things together with Baker Mayfield and, and through some early struggles in Baker Mayfield's career. I always said that Kevin Stefanski getting hired after, you know, those those terrible Browns teams end up drafting Baker Mayfield basically gave Baker Mayfield a career because otherwise that would have just went down the same path that Johnny Manziel went. If they would have kept going the way they were going. But the position the Browns are in right now, there is no direction to go other than to completely tear this thing down and start from scratch like throw everything out. I would be offering up just about every single player that's worth draft capital right now to try and recoup what they lost in the Sean Watson trade. And, and I would probably be moving on to a new coach because how many times can you just keep bringing Stefanski back? And, and now he's going to have to rebuild the team here in Cleveland. The Browns fans are going to get impatient again. This team's going to be really, really bad for a couple years again. And I don't think Stefanski's going to live through that anyway. So might as well make the move now and start the rebuild now and give your next head coach some premium picks from hopefully players that they trade here at the deadline. Yeah, I'm going to go. So you're going to go scorching hot? I'm going yeah. scorching hot. I, I think I think this is his last year if he makes it to the end. Yeah, I'm going to go hot, right? And I just want to be clear. There's four different flavors here. It's like wings, right? So there's medium hot. I don't know why it's not showing at the bottom, but there is <laughs> mild, medium hot, hot, and scorching hot. I'm going to go hot here. And I think this has scapegoat written all over it, right? Now, last week, I kind of prematurely, you know, announced that I, I thought his job was safe because I thought that if Deshaun continued to play, that ownership would try to justify the contract by firing him to put the blame on him for Deshaun Watson's ineptitude. But Deshaun Watson got hurt, obviously. His season is over. And now I'm thinking about it. He just stepped down from play calling. That's usually the first step on your way out the door, especially if you're a guy that calls plays. When you get demoted, you keep getting demoted. It's like a, it's like a, you know, a demolition, right? You go down, you go down. So I think for me, it's looking likely that he is on the hot seat right now. And it's unfortunate. You know, he was playing. He was coaching well before Deshaun Watson, right? Obviously, he didn't make the trade for Deshaun Watson. That was ownership. And now I think he's going to pay the consequences of ownership making one of the worst decisions of all time, which is trading for Deshaun Watson. So I'm going to go hot here. So I agree. I'm going to put him in the hot category as well. And I think both you guys brought up some pretty good points about the situation. But, Mike, it's funny. I remember on this show the day after week one when the Browns lost to the Cowboys and they got embarrassed in that game. I said that Kevin Stefanski should try to get out of Cleveland. 
this mm-hmm. offseason because the situation was so bad. He didn't want Deshaun Watson in the first place. And this guy, he's the only active coach in the NFL that's won coach of the year twice. He's done it two times. And for good reason. He got Joe Flacco to the playoffs last year. He won a playoff game against the Browns arch rival and the Steelers that have dominated them for years with Baker Mayfield. And Stefanski is a guy that I feel like if he were to get let go, another team would hire him in a second. And when I look at this Cleveland Browns team, do I think he's likely to get fired? I do. But would I fire him? No. And I think you saw that, especially the reasons for that with Jameis Winston on Sunday. I know that Ken Dorsey was technically the one calling the plays, but if you just look at Kevin Stefanski, the bottom line is if his quarterback is literally anyone not named Deshaun Watson, and we know Deshaun Watson is probably the worst starting quarterback in the league right now. If you give him anyone else but Watson under center, he wins. So if Cleveland does decide to move on, I think they're going to be a list of teams that are eager to hire him this offseason, and rightfully so. Again, the only coach active in the league right now that has won the Coach of the Year award multiple times. I think his seat is hot. I'm just curious to see if they do play better with Jameis Winston, which they did on Sunday. Does that change anything? Because I, I, I'm not going to lie to you guys. Like Cleveland, their offensive line is getting healthier. Nick Chubb is back. He doesn't look like the same player yet, but I think the more he plays, the better he'll look. Cedric Tillman looks like he could step right into that Amari Cooper role at wide receiver. Their defense is getting healthier. Now it's unfortunate that they lost a uh, Wusu Kormosa, pretty, ba- uh, pretty bad neck injury. You hope he's okay. But I'm just curious to see if they do play better with Jameis. Does that change things? Yeah, and I think, and that's my last point before we move on real quickly. I think putting your faith, because I think Stefanski's job, is tied into what you would call a boomer bust quarterback in Jameis Winston, a guy that can throw for 300 yards and a couple of touchdowns because we give you three interceptions, right? He had a 30 for 30 episode a couple of years ago when he was on Tampa Bay, right? And then you got Ken Dorsey, the offensive coordinator. He's another boomer bust guy. Josh Allen led the league in turnovers last year, right? So I think Stefanski's at the basically at the mercy of consistency that these two guys, Ken Dorsey and Jameis Winston, is going to give. I've got unwavering faith, guys. Unwavering faith that Jameis Winston is going to throw three interceptions this weekend. Yeah, I won't it's be coming. I don't know when the three interception game is coming. It's it might coming, be though. this week. It might be in a few Chargers. weeks. It's definitely coming. All right, Logan since um, Stefanski is hot, I got to play this clip. You're fired. What? You're fired. Right, we are going to go on to the next coach here, Brian Dable. Zach, I want to begin with you. Where are we going here? So I'll go medium hot. I don't think he's definitely fired. And a lot of that has to do with John Mara coming out last week and giving him and Joe Shane the reign of confidence. But for me, guys, I still believe in Brian Dable, right? You see the work he did with Buffalo in Buffalo with Josh Allen. He made him better. This guy won, not only got to the playoffs, but he won a playoff game with Daniel Jones. And for me, when I watched the Giants this year, I do find myself consistently wondering what happened to the guy that was just so aggressive two years ago that was an out-of-the-box thinker that just wouldn't let them lose. I mean, you see that picture of him on our graphic. That's a picture of him when he first got hired. You see him now. Credit to him. He's lost a ton of weight. Looks like a totally different person. But I wonder if him losing that weight, he also (laughs) lost some of his coaching ability because I don't necessarily know if he's just the same guy. But for me, guys, it's what makes the situation tough is I think the number one culprit for the Giants' issues right now is not Brian Dable. I think it's their GM, Joe Shane, because he was the one that gave Daniel Jones that big contract. He was the one that let Saquon Barkley go. He's the one that has not been able to fix the offensive line. And Dable and Shane both came together to the Giants from Buffalo. So it's like, oh, if you let one go, do you let the other one go? It's always You always find yourself in conflict when you have that head coach and the GM that's on different timelines. And I kind of put Dable in a similar category as Stefanski. Like if he were to get fired after this year, I could see many teams knocking on his door and trying to hire him. That year, two years ago, was so good. And the work he did with Daniel Jones and Josh Allen was so good. I do think he is a capable coach in the league. And honestly, I think... When the Giants make the change at quarterback to Drew Locke, I think this team is going to look a lot better. And Dable has a lot to do with that. We forget that this team, they were in position to draft a Caleb Williams or Jaden Daniels. 
at the back end of last season. But Brian Dable did such a good work with Tommy DeVito that they ultimately won a couple games and that ended up really costing them. And I do think if you did give Dable a capable quarterback, he could make it work. But the Daniel Jones situation has got so out of hand that right now his seat is hot. But I'll say medium hot because I do think when they make the change to Drew Locke, he's going to make him look pretty good. And I do think the ownership there in New York, they gave him and Shane the vote of confidence. So I, I think he'll be back. I'll say medium hot. NFL Mike. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the timeline of this and the way everything's going, I would lean hot. But after, you know, you're saying like the, the ownership coming out and backing him, I'm starting to think maybe there's some kind of deal here for one more season if they did one more year with Daniel Jones. It was kind of forced upon Brian Dayball here. One thing that does make me think that his seat is going to be a little bit hotter than even maybe ownership is intending it to be by the end of this season is just what is going to be out there on the market. As far as coaches, it seems like it's going to be a crazy rotation. We're going to have multiple legends available again, just like we've seen in, in the last couple of years. And are the giants tempted by one of these guys is bill Belichick calling and saying, Hey, I'll take this Brian Burns and cave Thibodeau duo and make a lethal defense there in New York. And, and we'll piece together the offense. Are they going to be a team that, like, if some of these other guys, like two-time coach dear Kevin Stefanski is available, saying, hey, maybe this guy's a little bit more proven than Brian Dayball. We, like we said, we're going to have a high pick, just like we were talking about with the Cleveland Browns. Like, do the Giants get tempted, and, and do they change their mind as we get closer to the, to the cycle and we see what's available? I still think also, like, these coordinators are going to be moving around, especially if the Cowboys' jobs open, the Eagles' jobs possibly open. Other jobs are possibly open. I think a lot of coaches are coming up from college. They don't want to mess with the NIL stuff anymore. Like, are the Giants going to get tempted out of Brian Dayball here? That's what worries me a little bit. But I'm going to go with medium hot as well because of ownership just flat out saying that they're not going to fire him pretty much. Um, they're basically saying it. Yeah. I'm they changed go their high. mind, though. <laughs> they changed yeah, their mind. Um Especially, like, we saw what Saquon Barkley did. And I know Dable was the one that was not the one that directly made that decision. And he, by the way, too, guys, Mike, I don't know if you watched the the hard knocks with the Giants. I was all over. I thought I thought it was great. Brian Dable, he told Joe Shane, like, I want to trade up and get Jaden Daniels. I want to trade up and try to get Drake May. They weren't ultimately able to get a deal done. But I just find that ironic. Like, again, I, I think Joe Shane, if you're moving on from one of the two, he's the guy that deserves to go. But it's always tough getting that head coach and GM on different timelines. The Giants but, are a lock to, to go quarterback next year. Yeah, definitely. And I think for me, I'm going to go hot. And the reason why I'm going to go hot is because NFL Mike, you kind of like tilt the balance for me there when talking about the legends that are available, right? There's not a lot of opportune times where you have the greatest coach of all time available doing media, knowing that he wants to come back into the game. And I think that's a prime. Like, if I had to pick a location that Bill Belichick could potentially be in next year if he comes back to coaching, which I assume he will, the Giants will be at the top of the list for me. So because of that, I'm going to go hot because I think even though they may be something underhand as far as verbal commitment beyond this season, I do believe in the NFL we know things could change in a heartbeat, and I get it. Brian Dable inherited a mess, right? He didn't allow Saquon Barkley to leave. That was Joe Sheen, right? He wasn't the one that made that call. But the reality is he has a losing record. You know, it reminds me almost in a weird way, and maybe I'm wrong here, but just excuse my analogy here. But look at the Jets, right, with mm -hmm. um, Robert Sala after last year. He had a losing record, and he was given an assurance that, okay, you know, because Aaron Rodgers went down, you're going to have this year to work your manager. But guess what? He abruptly got fired in the middle of the season, right? So things could change. Obviously, he had a couple games to prove something, but things could change in a heartbeat in the NFL. I think Bill Belichick will end up being a giant. Like, I think he will be the head coach, and that's why I'm going to go hot. I think the question the Giants have to answer is, did, are, are Dable and Shane deserving of drafting that quarterback? And again, it's tough because I think Dable, whoever, whichever quarterback he likes, he could make it work. Again, he wanted Jaden Daniels. He wanted Drake May. But Joe Shane, some of these mistakes that he's been making, and you saw it in hard knocks, I'm not sure he's a guy that's deserving of getting that opportunity. And that's why this organization right now is really stuck. I mean, even with the play calling, right? 
Um, Brian Dable, I believe, is calling the plays, right? Like, is it a, like a 50 50 partnership or Brian Dable is like 100% calling the plays? He's calling be- them. Yeah, he's calling them, yeah. right? I mean, look at that play last night with all the linemen on one side of the football field. I mean, come on, bro. Like, there's certain things. It's not only quarterback here, there's certain calls and play calling that I'm seeing with the Giants. I'm like, what is that? So I think he has to be accounted for that as well. Yeah, and, and there's these guys, man, and I like Brian Dayball. I wanted the Chargers to hire him when he was up, and we we hired Brandon Staley instead. A lot of guys benefit from these quarterbacks, dude. Working with Josh Allen can really give you some credit before maybe it's deserved. I agree with that. We are going to move on here. So he avoids the Yafai clip, okay, because there's two medium hots here. We are going to go with Antonio Pierce next. How do we feel about him? And if I might do it, uh, I think he's I think he's hot. Yeah, not scorching hot. I think he's on the hot seat for sure, just because of the Raiders' history with coaches and the way that this whole storyline has went down with the Raiders hiring has made no sense to me. And it just makes me feel like something weird is going on. And, and that that Mark Davis has no commitment to anything that's going on with the Raiders right now. So I don't have any confidence that he has commitment. To coach Antonio Pierce. I think also when you look at this, it's kind of almost an experiment. Like they're trying to hit on their Dan Campbell. They're trying to hit on their guy, their their linebacker that turns into this motivator that Cal, you know, gets the whole team to rally around him and they play at this crazy high level. And then you build the roster around that culture, but it's just not coming to fruition. We're seeing drama in the locker room again. I don't know how the Raiders do this year after year it's very entertaining for me to watch as a raiders hater and chargers fan but year after year that locker room is just to pieces something tragic happens there's a player that's in there that's a cancer to the whole entire locker room superstars want out nobody wants to ever be there by like week eight in every single season and it's it's just it's going to continue until they get someone in there that's able to just put all that to bed and also able to tell Mark Davis, like, hey, man, I got this. You need, you need to get your hands out of this freaking cookie jar because this ain't working anymore. They had no business even making that crazy Devontae Adams trade a couple years ago before Josh McDaniels proved anything to them. And, you know, look what happened. So I think that the reason Antonio Pierce's seat is hot, especially right now, is because the Raiders are showing no improvement in the culture. And that's his whole freaking job. This isn't an X and O's guy. No offense to linebackers out there. I love y'all. This isn't an X and O guy. Like he, he is not out there out coaching anyone. I don't think in the NFL, he's supposed to be motivating this team. This is supposed to be a high level culture. We're supposed to start to see some improvement from the Raiders and they're getting worse and worse and worse. And their culture is getting worse and worse and worse. So for that reason, I think he's on the hot seat. And I also think that all along throughout all of this, Mark Davis has not had a strong commitment to Antonio Pierce. He's kind of treading water until they get into the next couple of years. And now we're going to see Brady and, and, and this whole thing go down. So, so we'll see what kind of influence he has in the next coaching hire, which will probably be next offseason or the one after that at minimum. Yeah, I'm going to go hot here as well. And the reason why is because... You talk about them trying to reincarnate Dan Campbell over there in Las Vegas, but it's more closer to Jeb Saturday, if you ask me. Mm -mm -mm. And I think in order for you to get a Dan Campbell type of effect where a guy is a culture setter used by his motivational tactics, you're going to need a Ben Johnson. You're not going to do it with Luke Getze, bro. It's not going to happen. At least they have a good ownership there on the lines they got a good coaching they got good coordinators that's why they're able to you know do what they do along with dan campbell and what he's able to bring to the table the raiders don't have those components around antonio pierce so i think you take in consideration tom brady having ownership now is he going to want to look out for his guy i talk about bill belichick right on the last topic is he going to want to hire bill belichick right this has splash move written all over it and i think the reason why i didn't do that last year was because they got pushed back for firing rich passaccia which they know they probably shouldn't have done yeah so we're all on the same same wavelength here i'm gonna go hot as well and lil i think you make a good point i, I think the reason why they brought 
Antonio Pierce back was exactly because of that Passaccia decision. I'm sure Mark Davis has regrets because the Josh McDaniels hire, as Mike alluded to as well, really blew up in his face. And also the players really liked Antonio Pierce and they wanted him back. But A, that's not how you should be hiring your coach if, you know, based on how the players feel about him. And B, if you're not winning and the culture isn't improving, then what does it matter? Um, I also agree. I don't think Pierce is going to get fired this offseason just because the Raiders have gone through so many coaches. I think he'll be back. Uh, and they do need some star power. I think that might happen on the field compared to off the field. But my question with this situation is, could Tom Brady save this organization? We know what he is as a player and all the success he had. And it's an interesting move bringing him in considering, you know, he's the number one Fox guy he, he's announcing. And there's a little bit of a conflict of interest there. But we know that Tom Brady wants to run a football team. He's been eager to get in this really even before he stopped playing. And I think if you're a Raider fan, that has to be your hope right now. Could Tom Brady come in right away as an owner and save this team? Because we know under Mark Davis, that's not happening. As a Raider hater, it, it does worry me because – their biggest problem is is their entire ownership, their entire team over there, their entire franchise has has for the last like 20 years played way too much fan politics. They sit here and sit on Twitter and they make moves catering to their fans, man. Their fans beat the desk for a freaking elite wide receiver and they get the elite wide receiver even though they know they don't want the quarterback that he came to play with. Their their fans lose their mind and they want this coach fired. He's canned He's in, he's, he's in, he's out. Like whatever the fans start to do and start to freak out about the ownership and everyone reacts to it. Tom Brady's going to put an end to all of that. So it's not going to be about fan politics anymore. He's going to come in and want to just win football games. And it's the same thing with, with Tom Telesco. Tom Telesco did the same thing with the Los Angeles Chargers rosters over the years. You see the moves that the Twitter experts want to see. Cause this guy's on here. You could tell he's on there getting all this fed into his freaking brain. Jim Harbaugh comes in here, lets Keenan Allen go on the first freaking day. He ain't playing no fan politics. We're trying to win football games and turn this franchise around. And that's what I worry about Tom Brady bringing to the Raiders. Mike, yeah. let me ask you this. Is there a more overrated executive in the game than Tom Telesco? Because I, I think he's right there. What has this guy won? Anything? I don't know what the Raiders were doing with that pick because like, they, they, have, they have Antonio Pierce as their coach. They're going to be this rough and tough destroy you type of team we don't care about your record we don't care that you got arrested at an airport with a bunch of guns we're trading for you midway through the season come in here you're our new cornerback one doesn't matter we're, but tom telesco is the most nerdy geeky gm in the history of time he only drafts freaking zion johnson an aerospace major justin herbert the quietest man in the freaking world straight a's quentin johnston like tom telesco avoids criminal charges like the freaking plague the most risky move he ever made was jc jackson in his entire general managing career and he went to the rough and rowdy and tough raiders like the philosophies don't line up at all and he has not fielded good football teams he's fielded teams with a lot of superstars he's gotten lucky at the quarterback position inherited philip rivers and landed justin herbert after two was taken a pick before him and just built a bunch of teams with no depth and look at the Raiders, a team also, with no depth. What I find ironic is the reason why Telesco got fired from the chargers. The last straw was that Raider game, right? The Raiders yep. sent them to the street. Yeah. And guess Friday. what? The fans will come his way right now. It's Luke Getzey. So he's getting the ax first and they're going to move to Antonio Pierce next season. So then he'll get the ax Tom Telesco's days coming where you'll see that sign in the freaking stadium Fired Telesco, and he'll be out the door. Mark Davis will will be all over our Twitter. Like, got you guys. Don't worry. Yeah, his time is coming. But right now, since we all have hot hair for Antonio Pierce, it looks like his time is coming sooner rather than later. Yeah. I want to go Mike McCarthy here. Zach, the con man of the NFL, is up. How are we looking with him? Yeah, well, this is going to be the first scorching hot for me, especially if this Cowboys season continues uh, the way it's been. And I think it is there. We didn't see anything on Sunday Night Football to make us think it's going to end any differently. And you really knew it's very rare that you see an NFL head coach go into a season as a lame duck. 
like on a contract year with just one year left and nothing else besides that. And I know we mentioned the Giants as a spot for Bill Belichick. I don't see that happening because I do think Dable is going to be back. So I think the Cowboys and there's one other team that I could possibly see Belichick going to that we haven't mentioned yet, but I think the Cowboys are going to be right there. I just don't understand how Jerry Jones could sit in his desk and sit in his booth and watch that Cowboys team in the playoffs last year against the Green Bay Packers from the start to the finish of that game, just get thoroughly embarrassed and say, you know what, we're not making a change at head coach. We're going to bring back Mike McCarthy, especially when McCarthy has proven throughout his career, he's just not a guy that could win in the playoffs. Uh, the defense has gotten worse since they let Dan Quinn go. Mike Zimmer is the hire to replace Quinn has not worked out. Uh, I think Dak, you could criticize him in a lot of ways, but one feeling I've always had about him is I've wanted to see him with the legitimate head coach throughout his career, and he hasn't had that, I don't think. He was never going to work with Jason Garrett. He's had a nice run with Mike McCarthy, but the ceiling with McCarthy as your head coach, unless you're an all-time great quarterback, just isn't necessarily there. And again, I think this Cowboys team has gotten worse. They've regressed. They get blown out every time they play at home. This one for me will be the first scorching hot one. I think McCarthy's out of a job by season's end. Yeah, Mike McCarthy, and I'm going to go scorching hot here as well. Mike McCarthy is one of those guys that he's like a journeyman, right? He's always going to get a job for the most part. And then it's going to run out. He may have a, a first couple of good years like how he had in Green Bay. And then the luck is going to run out. It's like milk that you put in the refrigerator. It's going to expire eventually. And I think his time is going to expire after this season. Right. And I think I agree with you, Zach. You look at that Green Bay wild card game at home. You get punched in the mouth with no resistance coming back. Right. That's the makeup of this Cowboys team. They're not physical enough. They don't know how to react to getting punched in the mouth, and that's going to cost them. This team has, if they can make the playoffs, has first-round exit written all over them, if they can even get to the playoffs, right? It's not even a given they're going to win this division. And I think when you pay your quarterback, Dak Prescott, all that money, when you pay C.D. Lamb all that money, if you're Jerry Jones, Jerry Jones is not going to like if the Cowboys do not make the playoffs after the investments he made. He's going to make moves. And Mike McCarthy, believe you me, will be the first cat out of there. I'm going scorching hot. It's it's scorching hot for sure. I mean, Jerry Jones said at the beginning of the season, they're all in this year. They're all in, and this is what's happening. So when you go all in and it fails, what do you do? It, he's done. And it, it's 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 going to be it for Mike McCarthy. And I think that they need to go defense also, Zach. I don't know if it's going to be Bill Belichick. I think that Bill Belichick's probably the guy that Jerry Jones would want in there because that just seems – very Jerry Jones to do. Go and get the biggest freaking name he possibly can on the entire planet. But these Cowboys teams with Dak Prescott, because of the style of quarterback he is and the style of offense that, that they have and the amount of turnovers specifically that, that he's put on the board, they need an elite defense to stay that 10 plus 11, 12 win team year after year after year. And we've seen this year now after losing Dan Quinn, just a couple injuries Guys are getting exposed, and this defense is terrible, and the rest of it has completely come falling down right behind it. They need to go defense with the with the coaching hire and just hire you know any hot coordinator, even maybe keep Kellen Moore there. They're going to be able to put this offense together with CeeDee Lamb because he's just that good of a receiver. He's a Justin Jefferson-level player. like He's unstoppable, and they need to build the defense, and they need to give Micah Parsons to stay. Because if I'm Michael Parsons, I'm getting really pissed off, and he is not under contract yet, and he is someone that could try and hit the road forcefully instead of stay in Dallas and deal with it if it continues to be a shit show. Get a defensive coach in there, rebuild that defense back to what it's been over the last couple of years, and let you can get this thing turned around and right back in order pretty quickly, I think, and, and maybe even in a season. Yep. Um, scorching hot all across the board. Mike McCarthy, this is for you. Yeah! I'm going to go one more, and then I'm going to allow everybody here to choose. Okay, so I'm going to give one more guy, and then each of us is going to choose a guy that we haven't brought up yet, and that's how we're going to do it to, to end up this segment. So the last one I'm going to go with to throw out there is Nick Seriani. What do we feel about him? And if I mic you up. I think it's mild. I think recently it's definitely cooled off even more. Uh, this year going into it, you could say, I guess, his seat – 
was heating up because the Eagles have such high expectations. This is a really freaking good team. So they can't keep falling short, but I think that we're starting to see it really uh, whipping the shape, kind of how I expected the Eagles to be. I expect them to struggle a little bit more defensively early on in the year with the younger secondary, and it, and it start to grow together as they got into the middle portions of the season, and we're starting to kind of see the defense play a little bit better, and the offense, especially the offensive line combined with Saquon Barkley, is as lethal as we expected it to be. So I think in the long run, the Eagles are actually going to be in this. I still think that the, e the Eagles are going to be the ones racing with the commanders here down the stretch of the season for the division and maybe even beating them out and winning the division. And that's going to get rid of all talks of firing Sirianni. Um, it's, it's when we get to the playoffs, can Jalen Hurts avoid making some of these mistakes we've seen him make, it, it, especially over the last year and a half now of time? That's going to be the determiner for them in the playoffs. I hope that he does because I'm a fan of the Eagles this year. I'm rooting for them to do well. But I think for Sirianni himself, I think the team's just so good and they're going to be good the rest of the season that this is going to cool off. And he's not going to be in the same spot as McCarthy by the time we get to week 18. Yeah, I'm going to go medium hot here. Um, and look, you know, I think the Eagles right now are in contention to potentially make the playoffs. But that doesn't mean I don't think this team has – first round exit written all over them, right? Um, I think coaching matters in the league. And I think Nick Sariani has been exposed over the last couple of years of being a fraud. Every time you look around, this guy's, you know, chirping at fans, at fans in the stands, home fans and all that. That's not a good look for your PR. Another thing, you go back to that Super Bowl a couple of years ago, he actively cost the team the, the game, the, the chip with his lack of aggression. He was aggressive to start off the game. He took his foot off the gas and that's how they lost to the Chiefs. I think it's evident to me when you strip a guy of his play calling duties, um, clearly that has happened. When you fire coordinators, right, and replace them with new coordinators, there's expectations to win a championship. And if they don't do that, and if they don't even win a playoff game, I think he could be out of there. If they don't win in the playoffs, he's out of there. That's how I look at it, and that's why I'm going to go medium hot. I agree. Well, give me an update. So what's what's higher, hot or medium hot? It, it um, hot medium is, is higher. Hot. hot. Okay. So I'll, I'll go medium hot as well. If we were to do this segment a few weeks ago, I probably I, I would have said scorching hot because there was no explanation for how poorly this Eagle team was playing. I agree with Lil about the antics with the fans. That just can't happen. But if you look at this Eagle team, they're sitting there right now in first place in the NFC East. They're right there. Everything is right in front of them. And I was very impressed with their effort on Sunday in Cincinnati. They uh, really dominated that game, especially after the first quarter. I thought Hertz was great. Best game he's played in a while. I think they're a different team when A.J. Brown is healthy out there on the field. He's one of the best receivers in the game. And when you look at uh, this Eagles team, they're sitting there at 5-2. and two. Uh, They have the Jaguars at home this week. That's a game they should win. Go to the Rams after that. That's not an easy game, but a game they should win. Very winnable. And when you look at this team, they're right there. As bad of a start as this team has gotten off to, it, it kind of sometimes feels like their record is much worse than it actually is. And I think we could look back at that game on Sunday in Cincinnati and the Saquon game in New York as well as a real turning point. If this team makes the playoffs and even wins a playoff game or two, I think Sirianni will be safe. I expect them to do that. I just think Sirianni... He's ultimately what's going to cost them a championship. I don't think this team is going to the Super Bowl, but I think they could win a playoff game or two, and that's where Sirianni, like that's where the issue is. But I think he'll do enough to be back next year. I'm going to go with uh, medium hot as well. All right. Now we're going to, each of us is going to pick a guy that we haven't discussed already, and that's where we can end off. I'm going to go with my guy that we haven't discussed. He's not my guy, actually. Um <laughs> Doug Peterson, I'm going to go with him, and I'm going to go scorching hot here. Teach me how to Dougie, or should I say don't teach me how to Dougie, right? Because um, I don't want to learn how to Dougie. That's his name because this guy has not been the guy that we thought he was going to be when he took over the job. We thought that. I remember when he took the job for Jacksonville, me and Zach gave that higher A. We thought that was one of the best highs that could be made to save a guy like Trevor Lawrence's career from Urban Meyer. But instead, he's thrown his career in the fire. Even though he got paid this offseason, 
and he can, you know, relish that opportunity in those finances because of a playoff game he won primarily against your charges, NFL Mike, when they blew that 27, you know, the zero lead or 21. I forgot the score, right? They blew a lead. He came back. That was his best game. I felt like he got that contract because of that game primarily. Now, it's unfortunate, um, NFL Mike. We had that one in the bag. But, you know, I think for me, this team finds ways to lose games. That's a reflection of poor coaching. When you find every opportune time to lose a game, that's coaching. It's a reflection. It's a mirror. This team is not well coached. Um, you know, for a minute, he didn't want to call the plays. Finally, he decided to call the plays. They was already in a hole. Um, Trevor Lawrence has not looked like the quarterback that he was supposed to look like thus far. He looks average. Now, the last couple of weeks has been a little bit better, but he's still a little bit inconsistent. They had a winnable game against the Packers last week at home. They blew it. This team finds ways to lose games. And after you pay your quarterback that amount of money and you have a losing record, you're not going to make the playoffs. Your head coach got to go. I'm going with scorching hot. Yeah, I mean, that's he's probably done. <laughs> I don't know what else they can do, honestly. They just signed Trevor Lawrence to a crazy deal, and the only thing he can do really is go to a new coach and try it. I agree. I'll go scorching hot as well. As a matter of fact, I was surprised that Peterson didn't come up yet. Um, I was looking forward to talking about him, but yeah, they just paid Trevor Lawrence, so there's only one more thing to do. And one thing about Doug Peterson that has really turned me off, and this has happened multiple times this year, is after these games when they lose in, in his press conferences, he just has no problem throwing his players under the bus, saying, oh, as the coaches, we called great games. The players just have to execute. And if you're in that locker room, that definitely cannot sit well with you. That game in London against the Bears was an embarrassment, considering the Jaguars are the team that every year they go to London. They should be used to it. And Mike, we just spent one of the segments early in the show ripping Matt Eberflus and how inept of a coach he is for the Chicago Bears. Well, he coached circles around Doug Peterson in that game, and the Jaguars were thoroughly dominated by Chicago in that one. So that's a brutal look. Scorching hot as well. And the Jaguars are actually the other team, I think, that is in play for Bill Belichick. We know that Shad Khan is a guy that has no problem making the big moves. He cares about the headlines. Uh, he, I think, would be willing to pay Belichick a lot. Those are really the two teams I'm eyeing for Belichick services, Dallas and Jacksonville. Yeah, and I think this is my last point. You look at the Eagles when he first took over the job. Carson Wentz, he looks like an MVP. That ran its course. It's like the spoiled milk in the refrigerator. It's going to spoil. And the same thing with Jacksonville. They won the playoff game with Trevor Lawrence. And we're looking for this progression. We're thinking Trevor Lawrence is ready for a significant year three leap. And we don't get it. And here we are. Scorching hot. Yeah! Fire! I'll hop in here, guys. And there are two coaches I want to talk about that haven't been brought up yet. I was going to bring up Doug Peterson, so I'm happy Will did so I could get to these two guys. And I feel like many times in the NFL during these head coaching cycles, there's a guy or two that gets fired that just no one sees coming. That wasn't even on our radar. I remember Brian Flores with the Dolphins a couple of years ago is a prime example of that. Even last year, I know... He technically didn't get fired. They listed it as a mutual parting of ways, but I don't think anyone had Pete Carroll uh, getting let go from Seattle on their radar. That ended up happening. So there are two guys I wanted to talk about. And number one, the first guy I'll bring up, I think if we were having this conversation last week, maybe he would have been included in our segment because things were looking very bleak. And I I'm just wondering about Gerard Mayo with the Patriots and it's very rare that a coach goes one and done. I understand he had a huge win over the Jets on Sunday, but I feel like the storylines and the headlines coming out of that game was just how inept the Jets are, and rightfully so. But this guy openly called his team soft, and the next thing you know, you have Bill Belichick talking about how he feels bad for the players, that they're not soft, that it's Gerard Mayo's coaching that is really the problem. And then you even had reports come out last week that Gerard Mayo went behind Bill Belichick's back last year talking with Robert Kraft about the future. Robert Kraft labeled Gerard Mayo as the guy uh, to replace Belichick years ago. But I just don't know how many games the Patriots are winning left in the season. And if this team finishes with like two or three wins, is Robert Kraft really going to let Gerard Mayo back? I don't know. So I think he could be a surprise one and done. I think that's one to watch. I would like to see Drake May with a little bit more capable offensive coach. Uh, Alex Van Pelt has not really been impressive 
uh, so far. So I'll put him into this category. And another one that I don't think many will see coming considering this team made the playoffs last year. They got off to a very hot start this year, but things have kind of unraveled the last few weeks. And that's Todd Bowles with the Bucks. Like, I've just been very underwhelmed with the way this defense has been playing. That's supposed to be the strength of their team, especially under Todd Bowles. And the main reason I bring this up is – I think the Buccaneers offensive coordinator, Liam Cohen, is the real deal. Like, I think if there's a good chance he could get hired as a head coach somewhere else in this cycle. And if I'm the Buccaneers, I'm really wondering. And Jason White is a smart GM. It's like, why not just elevate the offensive coordinator, especially if the Buccaneers defense continues to be this bad? I know that they have injuries all around, but they seem like a team to me that when you look back on their season, and I know injuries again, but that Ravens game, they should have been up 17 to three and just dumb mistakes cost them. Baltimore credit to them. were able to take advantage. I think those are two guys, Gerard Mayo and Todd Bowles that I don't necessarily know if they're on anyone's radar right now, but I could see them being surprise firings. We see this off season, especially in Tampa Bay's case, if they miss the playoffs, they should be a playoff team, but I don't know if they'll get there. Yeah. I think uh, Gerard Mayo would be the guy that I would probably have as medium hot. And I, I lean more towards Mao, right? Like it's in between there because I can see where the seat is a little bit hot, but I can see him being, you know, not one and done as well. I think, you know, one thing that I've learned from Robert Kraft over the years is loyalty. You know, he was loyal to Tom Brady for the most part until he had to make a decision between Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. He was loyal to Bill Belichick, gave him a lot of opportunities to really update his philosophy, gave him a lot of power left him with that power for the longest time. The reason why he fired him was mainly because of the power he gave him. And he really had no choice but to fire Bill Belichick because he was not building a complimentary roster to his coaching style. Like it was his coaching that was doing good. Clearly he's one of the best coaches still in the NFL, but his roster building was tampering with his coaching ability. So he had to fire him. But I still look at Robert Kraft as somebody who's loyal based on what I've known following the Patriots as long as I did when Tom Brady was over there. So I have reason to believe that Gerard Mayer will get another crack at it. Look, he called this team soft. His team responded this week. So sure. whether or not we like it or not, what he came out and said, his team responded. Whether they like it or not, they came out and responded. So that's going to be an interesting um, situation with Ty Bowles. Yeah, the defense has you know, been a letdown. But um, there's a lot of injuries going on. We'll see. That's a very tricky, you know, one right there. But um, yeah, I'll leave it like that. I just Todd think Bull yeah. Liam Cohen, this guy's the real deal. If I'm Tampa Bay, no, I'm not going to let him out the door. He's legitimate. It's true. It's true. And I, I, Todd Bowles one of those guys. It could be either either or. I mean, he he's kind of one of those stopgap coaches, one of those guys that you, you can just throw in there and he can he can fill the role of a head coach at a high level because he's done it before. In the NFL, he has that experience, and it's worked out well for Tampa in the Brady transition into post Brady era. The Gerard Mayo one's interesting. What I think is going to happen is I, I'm going mild on Gerard Mayo. I don't know what to rate Todd Bowles. We'll say yeah. medium hot or hot. That was that was tough, but I think that that Robert Kraft for one, he, he is not going to fire Gerard Mayo after one season. I think also when the dust settles on this season. The Patriots are going to be the team that goes from be, being the most boring draft selections, guys out of left field, Colton Strange, you know, 50 picks ahead of where he's supposed to go, to the team that takes the dual threat player and gets Travis Hunter with a top three pick in next year's draft. And they just completely flip the script. And I think Gerard Mayo is the guy that Kraft has pick it, picked to lead that charge. They went quarterback early last year. I think next year they get the receiver corner. He's be playing with Christian Gonzalez on one side of the ball and all of these young receivers, you know, Jalen Polk and and Keek, uh Booty is starting to break out a little bit and and Pop Douglas with Travis Hunter playing some receiver on that side of the ball as well. That's, that's what I think is going to happen. And I think Gerard Mayo is at least going to be the coach that starts that off for the Patriots. So I think I mean, that's what the, I mean, what would Robert Kraft have expected this season? <laughs> this was projected to be the worst yeah. season of the Patriots organization. So, I mean, you know, we knew it was going to be in, They didn't come in trying to win games because exactly. Kobe Brissett it was a starter, and it's very clear that Drake May is their best option to win, but they were scared to throw Drake May out there because they're being 
self-aware of what they have on the offensive line, and they were worried about their quarter, rookie quarterback going out there and getting obliterated in the first game. Yeah, I agree. I right, NFL Mike, your last guy that you want to bring up. Yeah, I have I have two that I wanted to bring up. Um, one, I was just at the game, and about 50-50 split, by the way. Chargers fans, y'all showed up. 50-50 uh, is good for SoFi, by the way, between the Saints fans and, and the Chargers fans there. And the sentiment and the yelling and the screaming and the anger. Saints fans don't want Dennis Allen to be the coach of this team anymore, and I see why. He's a defensive coach. He's brought in here to help the defense, and the defense is literally the worst in, in the league right now. They aren't tackling anybody. They aren't sticking anybody. Marshall Lattimore is getting a bunch of penalties. like, And they have players still on defense, but they're still terrible. I think the entire fan base wants him fired because there's no way up from this point with him as head coach because the defense obviously isn't improving. The offense has no direction quarterback-wise. Um, I think that this whole Alvin Kamara situation is a, a little bit interesting. They signed him assigned him to like a very team friendly, easy to move two year, like rapid deal. And they didn't sign him. They just basically said, Hey, we're going to get out of this contract dispute for the time being while we figure some shit out. Uh, I think that the Saints are going into a full blown rebuild. So scorching hot on Dennis Allen. And then someone who I'm surprised hasn't been brought up at all is Zach Taylor. I, I, they had the year that they ran to the Super Bowl, and that's gotten Zach Taylor to this point. But other than that, to me, the Bengals keep failing over and over and over again. And, yeah, a lot of it is because of injuries. And sometimes you give the coach the pass because of injuries, but you can't give him the pass over and over and over again. And the way this season has went should not be the way it's going. I feel like the first four games, the Bengals should have won. And they just made little mistakes here, made little mistakes there, penalty there, and they, and they barely lose. They came out dead against a team like the Patriots and dropped that game as well. And now they found themselves in this situation where they just lost to a really good Eagles team, and, and they're 3-5. and five. I, I think the Big Ones missed the playoffs. He's, sco he's scorching hot right now. If they miss the playoffs, he's gone. If they, make, if they somehow squeak into the playoffs by a miracle and lose, I still think he's gone. I think the Bengals are a team that needs to kind of Get rid of that entire staff and, and start from fresh. The defense has been really good with Lou and Arumo, and I think that he will get a job somewhere else. But it's just it's just gotten to a point where they don't have the roster anymore that they had in those previous years on defense. They don't have Jesse Bates anymore. They don't have the same type of interior rush that they had before. The linebackers aren't playing at the same level when they went on that Super Bowl run. So the defense isn't as good. The offense has been crazy and consistent, not just this year, but over the years. I think that someone can come in and take the Cincinnati Bengals roster back to AFC contention immediately. So Zach Taylor, scorching hot. Get out of there. Dennis Allen, scorching hot. Get fired, my guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go scorching hot on Dennis Allen. Um, I do believe that we already saw that the Derek Carr, Dennis Allen from Oakland wasn't going to work. It's not going to work over here. Um, Spencer Rattler looks rattled. Okay. This guy is erratic as they come. Um, this team is in disarray. This team is a mess. Um, he got to go scorching hot. I'm going to go hot on Zach Taylor. I do believe that with him, there's a lot of roster trouble. Lou Amarillo's defense has been disappointed. Um, disappointing. The ownership is the, to blame really for the lack of roster right now going on over there. But, um, you know, I don't think he's scorching hot, but I do think he's hot, especially if they don't make the playoffs. So, um, yeah, Zach, I'll leave it to you. Yeah, I agree. Dennis Allen needs to go. I think he might just be the worst coach in the league. If you look at his record, it's it's like I have it right here. It's like 26 and 51. That's just unacceptable, especially for that big of a sample size. And, Mike, I agree with, with your point on the rebuild. Like, I don't I just don't know why they didn't do it after Drew Brees and Sean Payton went out the door. Mm -hmm. I know historically the Saints have been – before those guys got there, they were one of the worst organizations in the league. And I think they just liked the idea of being relevant. Like the last few years, they were just eight and eight. They were right in the mix, but they were never going to win anything. And now it's really backfired, especially with all these contracts. So, yeah, I think they're in an awful spot. Allen has to go. Zach Taylor is interesting because I do think he's a bright offensive mind. Uh, I was very impressed with what he did with Jake Browning last year after Joe Burrow went down. But the bottom line is this Bengals defense just needs to be better. I actually told Will this in our chat right after the game on Sunday. I predicted that Lou Anarumo was going to get fired sometime this week. Hasn't happened yet, so maybe he'll have a little bit of time to survive. But that defense is not good. 
I'll go medium hot for Zach Taylor. One name I wanted to bring up, probably because we already hit on him uh, during the show, is Matt Eberflus. I-, I think the Bears have one of the worst coaching staffs in the league. And Caleb Williams, if he ultimately wants to win, it's going to be with a different coach. And there was even a report today that Ben Johnson was heavily, heavily interested in taking that Bears job last offseason. But when they decided to bring back Eberflus, you know, he decided to stay in Detroit just when you thought this week couldn't get any worse for the Bears, they get hit with that news, which is just not ideal. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good point because I think to save Caleb Williams' career, just going forward, I think Ben Johnson stealing him away from the crosstown rival would be a move that they were opt to make. Um, Dennis Allen and Zach Taylor, this is for you. Yeah! Thank you for tuning in to another NFL Mike video. Now it's time to go make more football friends or go and compete in the Mike's Pick'ems Challenge or against me in, in daily fantasy football challenges by joining my completely free NFL group chat. Or head to fifthdown.shop and check out and see if we got your team's newest design. Or now you can simply rep your favorite players without having to wear another team's gear. And then tag us in pictures of you wearing your Fifth Down merch for a shout out in the next episode of NFL Mike's Corner. And help us reach our goal of getting a thousand NFL fans wearing Fifth Down. Or you can head to the next NFL Mike video by clicking it. It's on your screen. Go ahead.